honor it is to be t here tonight in the service, be a part of NAC. And I just feel like we've been having revival ever since the watch night service. It feels like something broke. Yes, yes. Kind of like whenever you have a fever and you're not feeling very good, and then all of a sudden you get that sweat. You wake up and you feel ten times better. I think that kind of comparative sort of, but I just feel like God is doing something in this house. Amen? In our lives. Spirits at work in this world. I just want to be a part of what God's doing in the end times. I'm excited about it. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to thank Pastor for this opportunity of being up here. And uh, always a pleasure and a great honor to be a part of NAC and the staff here. And, and uh, I want to thank my wife for everything she does behind the scenes. And she's such a great mom and a wife. So thankful to be blessed. But I want to go to the word of the Lord tonight. I want you to turn to uh, Romans chapter 12. And we're going to read uh, verses 1 and 2. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hallelujah. Let's set your Bibles down and let's just pray one more time before we seated. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this morning, God. Lord, we're looking forward to what you're going to do in our hearts and minds today, God. Help us not leave this place the same way we came in, Lord. Change us, Lord God, in your presence. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence that we feel here. And we give you all the honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I want to preach tonight on a title, Altered by the Altar. Altered by the Altar. A little play on words, but I believe every time we come to church that we ought to be altered by God's presence in some way. Since none of, none of us here are perfect, we're all here trying to get better. None of us has arrived. We're all reaching for a goal. But I want to preach on the altar tonight. In the fourth year of the reign of King Solomon, the temple started construction in Israel. It was not King David's to build because of the continual fighting of wars that he had to do, but instead it was left to his wise son Solomon. The temple was to replace the smaller and portable tabernacle Israel had been using while traveling to the promised land and settling it. But now the kingdom had been established, it was time to build a permanent dwelling place for God's presence. And so after laying down the cornerstone, seven years later it was completed. As you'd uh, bring up the first slide... And uh, this is just a picture of the, the finished temple. And when it was finished, the priests started to move all the holy vessels and items from the old tabernacle into the new temple. The last item that was moved was the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of the Lord. And it was moved into the Holy of Holies. Uh, when it was moved, this is what happened. In 1 Kings... Chapter 8, in verse 10 through 11, we read, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the, of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. The priests could not even perform their duties because the Spirit of the Lord was so heavy in that place. It was overpowering. Religious America needs to learn that God cannot be controlled by a service schedule. Just let him out of the, your church box now and then. Some things happen in the spirit during the service that didn't happen on the schedule. 
God has his own timing. It might be good for us to be less time conscious and more spirit conscious. You see, the priests couldn't even perform their duties in the temple after the, the Ark of the Covenant was moved in because the Spirit of the Lord was so thick. Sometimes you just have to tarry and let the Lord move despite what you want to accomplish. And so, pull up the next slide. But the, ve the vessel in the temple that I want to focus on tonight is the altar of burnt offerings, or is, is called the brazen altar. And there it is. As everything else that was in the temporary tabernacle, the bronze altar in the now permanent temple was much bigger. It was, in fact, the biggest single piece vessel in the entire temple besides the building itself. The altar was huge, measuring 30 feet by 30 feet by 10 feet tall, and had four horns on it, one on each corner. And it was placed in the inner court right before you could enter into the temple building itself. It was there to sacrifice animals as an act of repentance for sin. Today, because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the altar of the cross, we can simply ask for repentance, and we're forgiven. But not so in the Old Testament times. Sin required the shedding of blood, animals' blood. And this is where they did it. One thing I noted when studying the altar is its tremendous size. This tells me that God did not want a small sacrifice. Offerings should not be small, but big. I think if we bring a sacrifice to God, we ought, we ought not to bring the leftovers. Don't just give them a little bit. Give God your best, biggest sacrifice you have. Our God not only deserves, just deserves it, but he actually demands it. In 1 Kings chapter 8, going back to verse 63, and it says, And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered unto the Lord two and twenty thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. That same day did the king hollow the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too little to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat offerings of the peace offerings. So are you giving God your best or your worst? See, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he brought such a huge offering, not even the large brazen altar could hold it all. He had to dig a pit in the middle of the brand new temple just to house all the offerings he had. And my question to you is, are you dragging the church with no expectation? Did you bring him a little sacrifice tonight? Did he get your leftovers today? We got to give God a big sacrifice, a big praise. Like Sister Burnett stirred my soul tonight when she says, we ought to go big with God in our praise. Hallelujah. We don't need to just come here and just patty cake around and expect something, someone else to do something. Hallelujah. We ought to get in ourselves and contribute and worship God. Hallelujah. We should never let our fire die out also. There should be a continual visits to the altar to make sure our hearts are ready to meet God. You shouldn't just repent once a year right before communion but have a repentant heart, boldly entering the throne. It says in Leviticus 6, uh, verses 12 to 13, it says, The fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, and it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offerings in order, uh, in order upon it. And he shall burn therein the fat of the peace offerings. And it says, the fire shall never, shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. We need to keep that fire burning. We need to keep that fire burning our lives. We can't, we can't let the fire of God go out. We got to keep worshiping. We got to keep praising. We got to put, push past the hard times and look at Jesus Christ. 
You see, the, the brazen altar was in the inner court. So in order to get into the holy place and then into the holy of holies, you first had to make a sacrifice on the brazen altar in the court. Everyone wants a magic bullet. Everyone wants a certain formula, the inside secret to success. Here it is. There isn't one. The, the secret formula to really anything, but I'm talking in terms of living for God. It's really just a mindset change. It's consistently doing the right thing no matter who's around. It's about getting a hold of an old-fashioned altar and praying through when you're not feeling right. Romans 12, 1 and 2 again, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Hallelujah. So this isn't just a one-time thing when you repent and you get baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. Paul says to the Roman church, you need to present your bodies a living sacrifice, a, a fire that never goes out, uh, but a praise that you're continually bringing forth to God uh, in worship and sacrifice. It's true that we don't have a functioning altar today, and rightly so, because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost now. But that doesn't mean we should ex ex uh, escape the idea of giving God a sacrifice at the altars in our heart. In this world, uh, is this world conforming you or are you conforming this world around you? Is God's presence changing you more or is this world changing you more? If you are having a hard time with that question, then maybe it's time to find an altar. If you've been feeling on edge a lot lately, then maybe it's time to find an altar. If, if you can't remember the last time that you've prayed through, maybe it's time to find an altar. If you can't remember the last time you spoke in tongues, it's time to find an altar. How many days has it been since you found an altar? How many months? God help us if we can't come to his altar and offer up a sacrifice and a heart of repentance. We shouldn't avoid the altar, but we should be running to it, especially in these certain times we live in today. I've, had, I've noticed myself when you have to turn off the distractions of this world, I just need time alone with God. Hallelujah. Psalms 100 in verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. But if you bypass the altar, the word says you're not allowed to enter the holies of holies where God's presence is. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, if you just waltzed into the holy of holies without doing proper, the proper steps, which includes sacrifice, then God would strike you dead on the spot. Some of you may have wondered, why is my ministry dead? Why do I feel stagnant with my walk with God? Why do I feel like I'm just running on a treadmill? Why am I not being used more? Have you been bypassing the altar? You know, Brother Green was in this pulpit just a few weeks ago. And he said this, and I want to reiterate it because it stuck with me. He says, there's a lot of great churches, and I'm not uh, quoting him. I'm just uh, summarizing what he said. He said, there's a lot of great churches across America with a lot of great music. There's a lot of great preaching you see on TV. But he said the key is they don't have an altar. They have good worship, but no altar. They got great programs. They got great buildings and property. They got everything in order. They got the schedule. They got everything the way it seems it should be, but they don't have an altar. In other words, they have no repentance. They have no change. That's why mainstream Christianity is so anemic today. They don't only ever venture into the holies of holies. There's no power, just ceremony and pomp and dignity. Their pride doesn't want to be torn down by the humbling experience in God's altar. That's one thing that the apostolic church has out of many things, but we have a powerful altar service. 
Hallelujah. Maybe now some of you understand why we have such a thing as an altar service after the preached word of God. It allows you to engraft the word that was just preached here at the altar. The altar service is every bit as important as the worship and preaching. For without a sacrifice, you can't go into God's presence. It's told in, King, uh, in 1 Kings 1, in verse 50 through 51. And it says, And Adonijah feared because Solomon and arose and went, and he caught hold of the horns of the altar. And at this time, the altar of burnt offerings was in the tabernacle. It was much smaller, so he was actually able to reach them. I was, when I read that for the first time, I was like, wait. That's like 30 foot across. But this was in the tabernacle. But it says that he went in there and he grabbed hold of the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, uh, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon, for lo, he has caught hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me today that he will not slay his servant with the sword. And he was so desperate that he actually went to that altar humbly and boldly and grabbed the horns of the altar and got his heart right with God. And Solomon eventually spared his life. Sometimes we need to get that desperate where we're not going to let anything stop us. Lord, I don't want my heart not to be right with you, God. I, I, ought, I know I ought not be doing what I'm doing, Lord God, but I'm going to boldly come before your presence and grab the horns of the altar. Some people have the mindset that they can't come to church because everything's not perfect in their life. They don't want to, I, I, you know, this is something that I just think about because they think they're a hypocrite if they come to church because not everything's straightened out. They're like, well, I, I don't want to show up to church. I'll be a hypocrite if I show up. Well, then call me a hypocrite. Amen. Hallelujah. There's no one perfect here. I think all of us need to grab hold of the altar sometime and say, Lord, God, touch my heart, touch my life. I'm not perfect, God. I make mistakes, God. But I'm here at the altar repenting, Lord, help me. Don't let your shortcomings and your failures stop you from coming to church, and especially coming to the altar. Hallelujah. When 9-11 occurred, I was in Navy boot camp, but I've been told that right after 9-11 happened that America was more united, patriotic, but most of all, more repentant than ever. I heard the churches were full for weeks across America. People who hadn't gone to church in years were suddenly pouring in by the droves, getting their heart right before God. What happened since then? Where are the crowds now? What will it take for us to get our hearts ready before the master? What national crisis has to take place to bring America back to an altar before God and repentance? What tragedy must strike for us to get our hearts right with God and grab the horns of the altar? Why not take the time tonight to make that decision? It's time to make a statement of declaration. Like the Declaration of Independence Declaring inalienable rights. We need to declare some things tonight. Joshua declared to all of Israel in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. He says this, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in those lands ye dwell. But he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <laughs> Joshua said, no uncertain terms. You can go and serve who you want. You can do, go do your own thing. He says, but as for me and my house, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world is going to do. It doesn't matter the direction the world's going. Uh, but I'm going to serve God no matter what. Uh, no matter what anyone says. Uh, no matter what they say about me. I'm going to serve God in these end times. And I'm going to have my heart ready for when he returns. Philippians chapter 3 and 13. 
Paul says, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto the things which are before. Forget what happened yesterday and get a hold of God today. It's not about what you've done. It's about what you're going to do. And it's about what God's going to do in your life. And it's about where God's going to take you. Quit looking at the past and worrying about things that happened. It doesn't matter anymore. If it's under the blood, move on. Hallelujah. And if you got to come to an altar to get your heart and your mind right with God, then don't waste another day. In 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and 8, we read, And when Asa heard these words in the prophet, prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which had taken, for, which were taken from the Mount of Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. The King Asa, he was given a word of the Lord and it encouraged him so much. The first thing he did was he built, rebuilt the altar. He understood to get his heart right, to repent properly. He had to rebuild the altar in the temple that had been torn down and been neglected. I think sometimes we can neglect the altar to a point where it becomes in disrepair. And we haven't been to it in so long that we think that maybe we should never go back. But that's the devil speaking to you right there. It doesn't matter if you haven't been and visited the altar in years. Tonight is your night. At the start of any repentance or renewal or realignment with the Word of God, there will be an altar. As soon as King Asa heard of the convicting Word of God from this prophet, he put away all the sin out of his life, rebuilt the altar of the Lord, and he went down on his knees and got right with God. If you're not where you need to be in God, then this altar is going to be open for you tonight. The musicians can make their way forward. I'm preaching a very simple message. And I've kept it very simple. And you can go in the temple and there's all kinds of you. pastor could lay it out for weeks and weeks. Part 25 of the temple. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of typology. There's a lot of shadow. But I brought to you a simple message tonight of hope. There is an altar here tonight. This is why we call it the altar. This is where you come to get your heart right with God. You can repent anywhere you're at. But in the house of God, this is where you come. Because it's symbolism. You step out of the place where you're sitting. And you act on your faith. And you move your feet forward. And you come to a place with God. And you're, and you're telling God, I'm not just going to sit here any longer. But I'm going to act on my faith. The Bible says faith without action is dead. You have to put, you can say anything you want. It doesn't mean anything until you do it. God wants to see action. He doesn't want lip service. Hallelujah. Can everyone stand tonight? When's the last time that you let God alter your life in the altar? When's the last time you've been changed? The Word of God says when you become a new creature, all things become new. All things. Everything. But some of us have kind of let some things slip. We need God to help realign our lives a little bit. The altar is where we come and do it. When's the last time you've been altered by God's altar? This, and I'm not trying to preach fear, but this could be your last service. We don't know what the, the world has to hold outside of these walls. But don't leave here tonight without giving God the opportunity to make a difference in your life. And God says, if you hunger or thirst for righteousness, you shall be filled. There's a hope of glory here tonight for you. Hallelujah. You just have to have the boldness to come up and grab the horns of the altar 
and say, God, no matter what's happened in my life, I know you can forgive me. God, I know I've made mistakes, Lord. I know I may not be where I need to be. I know maybe I haven't been to the altar where, as much as I should be, God. But shake me tonight, Lord. I don't want to leave the same way I came in. This altar is open. I invite everyone to come. I invite you to come. This is not a message singling out any one individual. This is, this is for everyone. I've kept it as general as I could. We all need the altar of God. Don't bypass altar tonight. Hallelujah. If you feel more comfortable, make an altar there where you're sitting. Hallelujah. In the tabernacle, they moved the altar around. They did what they could. But don't neglect the altar of God. We got to get our hearts ready before this world winds down. Things are unfolding at a neck break speed. We have to make sure that we're ready when that trumpet sounds in the eastern skies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As they sing, let's go ahead and lift up a sacrifice of praise to God. If you have to repent, do it. Hallelujah. Let's get our hearts ready for God, for what He is going to do. Hallelujah. There's nothing more I'd rather